I was uh, very interested in space from a very young age. So at the age of maybe five or six, I lived in a countryside where the skies are very clear and I could look up at the night sky and see all the stars. And uh, I would sit outside with my father and watch satellites going over. And we would just talk about uh, what it might be like to be able to fly above the earth like that and look down on our planet. And I think that was the very first seed that uh, inspired me to start thinking about flying in space myself. So space exploration is showing us a whole new way to conduct science uh, without the forces of gravity. So where that's important is in the area of making fiber optic cables, for instance. We can make things uh, with far fewer defects in space than we can in the ground. Uh, another option is to create uh, biological cells in space, such as cancer cells. They grow faster in space. So we can grow cancer cells and then try a lot more drugs to fight those cells at the same time when we're on orbit than we can when we're on the ground. The most exciting part of a space mission, in my opinion, is the launch. Uh, it's the most dynamic part, where you're laying on your back in the spaceship and you start to feel the engines ignite and the, and the vehicle starts to rumble and you feel the vibration as it comes up the stack of the vehicle and then you get pushed off of the launch pad and, and it's just the most thr thrilling and exciting thing to realize that you're taking that trip from the planet into space for the very first time. So the last shuttle flight to the Mir was very interesting. The Mir had been there for quite a few years. It was um, aging. Um, it had already had the collision, uh, so part of the Mir was closed off. It had a lot of different uh, equipment bungeed to the sides of the tunnels and in, inside of the modules. But the most interesting part about Mir was that it did not have an up and down uh, for every part of the space station was not the same because we had modules going off in, in all the different directions. So you could sit in the center of Mir and you could look to your right and you could see someone maybe uh, working that looked to be sideways to you. You could look forward and someone might be upside down relative to where you are and you could look to your other direction to the left and see somebody on another surface where up and down was completely different. And it was the only place I've ever been or probably ever will be where life is relative to where you are inside your own module. Your up and down references are very unique to internal to the module that you were in, in in that space station. On the ISS, International Space Station, up and down is the same throughout the station, so you know up is always one, one direction, but on Mir it was not, so it was a very interesting observation to make. That's a good question. I, in my opinion, we should go to the moon before we go to Mars. And the reason is because we know we will have failures along the way. We know we will have unanticipated design problems with our equipment. Um, the reason that I would prefer to go to the moon first is because we can thresh out, you know, uh, kind of find some of those problems while we're on a surface that's only four days away. When we go to Mars, it's you know more than a, a year uh, to go there and back if we had an emergency. It's more likely a three-year mission. So we really can't afford for our equipment to fail on the way to Mars. So if we've tested it out on the moon's surface, the fine particulate is very similar on the moon as on Mars. Uh, Mars has a, a small atmosphere, a, a, a thin atmosphere. The moon has none. They both have a lot of radiation compared to the surface of the Earth. So if we can get our equipment and our people to function well on the moon's surface, we increase our chances of success when we go to Mars. Uh, 
Um, the ideal structure for a Martian colony, I think we would probably have to look back in history to some of the original exploration uh, groups of people and how they organized and which ones succeeded and which ones failed. Um, it's uh, typically, you know, you're in a harsh environment with a lot of unknowns, uh, you know, a lethal environment if we're not carefully prepared and to have adequate supplies. So we, we do need strong leadership, but we also need uh, compassionate leadership, understanding that we're very far from home, that people will be missing the home planet and their families that they left behind. Uh, and but a, a leader that is strong in their uh, motivation to uh, continue to, to do the mission and to succeed in that, uh, in that mission. So um, I think I would study a lot of the past history and pick the, the type of leadership and the type of structure that worked best and then apply that to the Mars program. So for psychological training, I think that's crucial, probably more important for a Mars mission than any other type of mission that we've done so far in space, just due to the duration. So it's, you know, it could be, um, depending on the propulsion system, from nine months to a year to get to Mars, you would stay on the surface about a, a year and then you come back another year. So anticipating about a three year time frame where you're away from home. So. It's not just that you can't go home because we have a lot of people that are deployed in the military and things like that, but the distance prevents you from, an, even in an emergency, getting back to safety. So we have to uh, consider that when we do our psychological selection of individuals, people who are very hardy, who are very robust, who uh, know how to accept challenges that are very difficult uh, physically and mentally, uh, who are good with isolation, uh, who are good with emergency response. Uh, so those kinds of interactions in a small team are very critical, as well as the time delay in talking with our home base back here on Earth. There will be a several minute delay in uh, communications. So you have to be able to communicate, wait for a period of time before you get the response back, wait until you can talk again. Um, so all of those things, um, having people who are very well prepared mentally, and even then, that it's still going to be a significant challenge. There are a few differences between men and women, not a large amount, um, probably genetically uh, predispositioned uh, in some way or another between the two genders. Uh, we have found that the um, intracranial pressure seems to uh, affect women less than men, that, and that is when the fluids from the lower extremities go up into the brain and, and, and cause pressure inside the brain and also on the, on the eye, and it squeezes the optic nerve. That seems to occur more in men, but uh, that may be just because we have a small number of women so far. Uh, Radiation-wise, um, women have you know, smaller chest cavities in general, so are uh, generally more prone, uh, are more susceptible to radiation damage in the chest and reproductive organs than men. Um, so, for younger women, it can be more dangerous to do a long-duration space flight above the you know, Earth's atmosphere for longer periods of time although it does affect obviously both genders. And for long duration missions, uh, we have found that, um, I don't think it's gender specific, that's, but that certain people do have the ability to uh, repair their cells better than other people's ability to repair their own cells from radiation damage. So uh, it may not be gender specific, but it may be something genetically that we do need to look at. Oh, there are so many groundbreaking discoveries. One that I uh, flew on my very first mission was the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, and Italy has had a, a major role in producing that experiment. It is currently on the International Space Station, and it's to help us understand dark matter and antimatter better. Uh, the most 
productive for daily life here on the ground, I think, may be the medical discoveries that we're uh, anticipating with respect to cancer uh, cell research and stem cell research. I think that probably has the greatest promise of bring, bringing back medica medications, drugs that we can use here on the ground to improve people's lives and fight cancers. Space tourism has really uh, come a long way in the last few years. It's become much more popular. Um, at my company called Sierra Space, I have a training program laid out for all levels of, of people who want to travel into space. So I have a full training program for professionals, uh, a different training program for scientists who want to go up and do their own science, and then a modified shorter training program for those that will just go to um, visit for maybe a week on a space station. Uh, it's still very important to know all the safety rules and regulations, how to escape the vehicle, what to do in an emergency, and how to get in and out of their spacesuits, how to use the facilities on the space station safely and properly. Uh, and, th and that will be the focus of that training. Uh, but we still need our longer duration and more professional astronauts to actually do the science and maintain the space station on orbit. <laughs>